welcome everyone to the American Civil War Museum's Homefront Education Series as we continue to walk through the war with you. Now, today I am joined by Stephanie Arduini, the Deputy Director of the American Civil War Museum. Uh, my name is Joseph, and we are moving into 1864. Now, this is an important part to note because while most people might think that 1863 is the real turning point, well, we know a little bit more about 1864, don't we, Stephanie? Absolutely. So one of the big things that we often hear about in textbooks is this idea that 1863 is a turning point, especially Gettysburg or Vicksburg. But I find this one particular statistic really interesting because just as many people died after those battles as died before. So if you're a person living in Civil War America, it's probably not going to feel like the tide is shifting in any significant way with so many people dying. Right, and especially because it just continues to go on and people are really having a different lived experience. Uh, they've gone through 1861 where they saw a battle that they thought was only going to be the end of the war, was going to be the end of the war right out, transform into a completely different thing. They saw the change in the war on both sides and then now they're dealing with this continued struggle and more and more people dying and more people being taken captive too, isn't that right? Absolutely, the chaos continues and there's that mindset of it couldn't get worse and then it does without an end in sight. And after the Battle of Chickamauga in late 1863, the prisoner of war population just balloons because the exchange system for POWs stops happening. Early in the war, people are able to, they're taken captive and then Confederate and United States officials trade prisoners periodically. But they stop doing that, especially because the United States government and the Confederate government can't agree on how to treat captured prisoners of war who are black soldiers. Right. And that's something that we can definitely dig into a little bit more in our next segment, too. And But we're just now seeing those folks who have been captured and their families are at home, and their families are preparing for something else that's pretty big in 1864. Uh, after all, the United States, every four years, has to elect a president. Absolutely. So if you're in the United States and you're preparing to vote in this election, so for example, people who support the Confederacy and are living in the Confederacy aren't planning on doing that. Right. But for those who are planning to participate in the presidential election in the fall of 1864, they're looking at all of this chaos without an end in sight and wondering who do they choose, if they're tired of the war, if they're struggling at home, if they want their family members back, if they're mad at Abraham Lincoln for the Emancipation Proclamation and including black soldiers in the United States Army, or if they're supportive of that and want to stand behind him and his efforts to continue the war, they've got some choices to make. Because behind us, you have Abraham Lincoln who is feeling really pessimistic about his options and, and really doesn't see much of a path for him to re-election, and especially because he's running against George McClellan, the United States general who he fired in 1862, who's running in opposition on a platform of peace and ending the war. He, it's capturing a lot of that momentum, and I think that's important to remember. Abraham Lincoln, the person that a lot of historians say is maybe the greatest president we've ever had, who we have monuments to, who doesn't think he's popular enough to get reelected, And I think that speaks to how deeply divided the United States itself is about the war. It's not blanket support for Abraham Lincoln. Right, I mean, there are a number of factors coming into play. Even his first election was one that was divided on a field of candidates. And so seeing how it's now just down to one, Lincoln and McClellan, those two, and people are making a choice that's very, very well defined based on how they want to see things going. How is it that Lincoln is even able to succeed? I think that's the great piece. It's even coming into the fall, he's really pessimistic. And it's not until William Tecumseh Sherman achieves some key victories in Atlanta, which then kicks off his march to the sea, that really pushes momentum in that direction. We also have, in 1864, Ulysses S. Grant, who's taken over control of the entire United States Army and comes to Virginia to personally oversee the Army of the Potomac in direct opposition to Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, which, while that's just one of many Confederate armies, it's become this symbolic head of the Confederate Army. So there's a lot of momentum, but there's a lot of death 
and it's continuing, and it's not until Sherman's victory is in Atlanta where enough people believe that maybe voting for Abraham Lincoln and his end the war, I'm committed to ending this, maybe that's not so far off. Maybe that is the right choice. And he just squeaks by. Yeah, and he squeaks by with a couple of important uh, players, too. As I understand it, the military component is actually one that drives a bit of his election, his re-election bid. That's, Absolutely. That's great. Well, I'm really glad that we were able to have the start of this conversation today. Uh, we're going to continue on with our next segment as we move into a little bit more about the military campaigns and some of the home front life uh, during 1864. Uh, but we do look forward to seeing you again and hope you join us for the rest of A Walk Through the War.